El Salvador. Situated on the coast of the Pacific Ocean, the country is the smallest in Central America, yet it's the most densely populated. It's the home of lush vegetation and fruit trees, breathtaking scenery and beautiful mountains, and it's known as the land of volcanoes. The country is so rich in many ways, but it is shaped by a history of civil unrest, gang violence, poverty, natural disasters, and deeply rooted social inequalities. COVID-19 has affected countries all over the world and developing countries like El Salvador have taken a harder hit than most. The shutdown of the economy leaves those who are already vulnerable in a position of weakness in response to the pandemic and its economic impact. With the livelihood of all affected, only a portion of the population have access to government assistance, impacting the ability to provide basic needs for families, such as food and medical care. We are bringing El Salvador before you today because it's also the birthplace of King's Castle Ministries, making it one of our countries of choice for our mission trips. And each time we travel there, we return home with our lives impacted through the beautiful people, the ministry, and of course we experience the power of God in tremendous ways. Although we go there to serve, we leave there with richer blessings than any amount of money can provide. And then we return home to share those experiences with our larger team. Some of us get to go to experience it firsthand. But our entire castle program, and I can say with confidence, our entire church, gets to experience the heart of the ministry through the influence of King's Castle Ministries right here at home. Through the COVID-19 lockdown, many ministries in El Salvador are struggling to make ends meet as well. And the church that we've connected with during our visits there, pastored by Roberto and Paola Palacios, has also been affected. After some discussion among the GT staff, it was decided that we should do something to help them, to give back to a ministry that so richly blesses ours. So, this online service will be a little different today. Through our time together, we pray that you will consider partnering with us and blessing this ministry. Good morning, Church. Since we're focusing on El Salvador this morning, we've added some different elements to our service. This actually includes a video chat with Pastor Roberto from King's Castle in Miraflores, El Salvador. And be sure to stay tuned until the end of the service when some of our King's Castle students will be featured. During different times in the service, you will see an option come up on the screen to give to the ministry in El Salvador. This can be done by sending an e-transfer to info at gtmoncton.com. Now be sure to write in the memo line that it is designated for El Salvador. Let's make a big impact on a ministry that has had a big impact on our church. God bless you as you give and enjoy the service. Oh, 
This next song is an old one. Uh, this takes us way back, takes me way back to, to my days in Newfoundland when I used to play at youth retreats, youth weekends. And yes, we used to do this song, and it was a hit back then. Um, but more special than that, actually, the memory of that, this song was my grandmother's, one of my grandmother's favorite songs. And uh, I got to actually sing it with her just a few months ago. Myself, my brother, our families, we went in and took the guitar and... Uh, she couldn't see very well, she couldn't hear very well, but when we sang this song, she just came alive, and uh, the words in it just spoke to her heart. And so we lost her just a little while ago, and uh, this was the first Mother's Day without her, but I want to dedicate this song to her. This song is The God That Cannot Fail. Well, I guess you've all heard the story How in the Bible was told about the three little Hebrew children and the idol made of gold. How the evil king he commanded that every knee should. Do what you must We're gonna put our trust In the God that can I God that will never ever fail For he's a great God to hold
Well, trust you've been enjoying these old songs this morning, a little bit different for us, but uh, we've had some fun playing them. We want to do one more for you. It's an old imperial song and uh, takes us way back. Actually, we were rehearsing earlier this week and Pastor Paul heard us playing it and he said, oh, I love that song. I remember when we were clearing out our dorm rooms in college and uh, we were blaring this song through the hallways. So this one's for Pastor Paul this morning. This one's called Gospel Ship. And uh, trust as, as you're listening this morning and praising along with us that you're also uh, letting God move on your heart to give. You've seen it on the screen a couple of times already. There'll be more opportunities this morning to give. But enjoy this last song before Pastor comes to preach. Gospel ship. Salvador, Pastor Roberto and Paola Palacios, and they are pastors in the community of Miraflores and San Ramon. Um, they have become very dear friends of ours. We're going to ask them a few questions today just so that you can get to know them a little bit um, so we can find out what life has been like in Miraflores uh, since the COVID-19 COVID um, pandemic has happened because it's a little different there. And so Spencer's joining me. We're just going to uh, spend some time with our friends today and um, let you hear their hearts as well. So we've got some questions for you. Uh, the first question is, tell us a little bit about your family and your ministry. 
Uh, my name is Roberto. She, my wife Paola. Uh, together, a student in Master Commission in King Castle, Castillo Rey, here in El Salvador. Twelve years ago, uh, I begin uh, this history in this place. Uh, I have two boys. The first voice, your name, your name is Josue, have 10 years old. Now is a rumor of the church. The second voice is uh, Caleb. Uh, he uh, four four years, years old. Uh, this is a, a one moment I think in my church and my ministry, difficult moment. So the other part, God is faithful with me, with my wife, with my family. This is nice in this place. Uh, Mira Flores in San Ramon now is part in my history and my family. So it's been hard since the, the COVID-19 pandemic started. Tell us what it's been like for your family and your community since this all started. Eh, bueno, desde que comenzó eh, la emergencia del COVID-19. When uh, COVID emergency started in Salvador. Eh, fue muy difícil. We had difi difficult moment. Porque tuvimos que cerrar las iglesias. But the class of the church. Ya no predicamos. No preaching more. No nos pudimos reunir con nuestros hermanos. Uh, no more meeting for the brother and sister in the church. Y entonces tuvimos que cancelar todas las actividades de nuestra iglesia. So, uh, uh, cancel the all activities in the church. El programa de eh, comedores infantiles. The feeding program for the children. Los niños ya no pudimos atenderlos. No see you more the children in the community and Mira Flores and San Ramon. Y sabemos que lo necesitan. Uh, I think the children needed food in this moment, so no more program. Yeah, we um, actually came back from El Salvador on March the 10th, and then the lockdown actually happened on the 11th. So right after we got home, we actually got home by the grace of God. Just <laughs> we had, Yeah, we had our entire trip. We got to do all the ministry that we had planned to do. And uh, the day that we left um, was the day that uh, things started to move in El Salvador. The next day, they shut down the airports and uh, things like that in various countries. And El Salvador was one of them. So um, we are so blessed to be able to be a part of the ministry uh, in Miraflores and San Ramon. Now, the work that we've done has been kind of put to a halt <laughs> as well. So when you go to the grocery store or the supermarket to buy supplies to buy food, how long do you have to wait outside before you're able to get inside the store? Uh, it's uh, maybe three blocks. It's very long, it's longer. So two hours. Wow. wow. And it's, it's difficult. A stand up three hours is problem. Maybe not for me, all the people. Yeah. Uh, I want to, maybe I want to supermarket, three hours. Next, I want to the third city, one hour more. Mm -hmm. It's four hours for buying maybe souvenirs, a medicine. Yes, it's difficult because the many people buy in the city. Mm -hmm. uh, you have already said a little bit about how God ha has been working in the middle of all of this. Uh, and we're so grateful for that. Just tell us some specific things that we as a church can be praying for, for you in El Salvador. Uh, help me pray for my family. Help me pray for the Kielin and the Kelly. It's a problem the respiratory. Mm -hmm. The protection for my people, the church, for, 
for my family needing a, a car. Mm -hmm. It's necessary in this moment. If for 12 years here in Middle Flores, no half car. Mm -hmm. uh, this is a problem here. Uh, five. So the the church construction project. Number one, uh, a wall and a row on the church. Two is a pride for one bus. I need it for San Juan and and the Flores here. This is necessary for my church. Uh, the new chair for the church. This is the chair is very old, it's broken. <laughs> no more uh, church and, and no more chair in the church. The three, the complete construction uh, on the building, the feeding program. Uh, the woman sleep, the other people come and visit me. Uh, the garden of the vision, the, the central church come. This and this building, no spinning. Uh, I need this break for this. Number six, uh, for my economy, each month for the pastoral family and the church too. Well, we're going to take a, a minute to pray for those needs now, and as a church, we'll continue to, to be praying for those as well. God, we thank you so much for our brothers and sisters that we have partnered with uh, mm -hmm. in El Salvador. We thank you for the King's Castle program uh, and how uh, special it is to our church and how it's been used in powerful ways uh, in our young people to raise them up and to disciple them. We thank you for uh, our, our friends in El Salvador and the work that they do there on the ground. And we just pray for each one of these needs that they brought forward, Lord. We pray that you would provide every resource, uh, everything that they need. We pray protection over their family for their health. Yes. We think about Jesus. Caleb uh, and the respiratory mm. problems there, Lord. We just pray for divine protection over yes, them in Lord. Jesus' name. We pray for the church and the physical needs that are, are, are there for the congregation, mm -hmm. uh, for the church building, and all the things that, that need to be done um, in order for that ministry to run uh, as it should. And so we just pray for the transportation situation for them so that they can get into town easily when they need to for emergencies and for getting food and everything else. Uh, we pray that you would just provide them uh, with good health, uh, with joy in the midst of this season uh, and every need that they may have. Lord, help us to just come alongside them, partner mm -hmm. with them, and to bless them with love because yes. they have been such a blessing to us. And so we just pray all these things and ask them all in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. So you say thank you for the pastor and your church. Uh, this opportunity, with this is first time the one church in Canada or in USA. This is the first time the, the this opportunity go mm -hmm. to the people in the church. Thank you. Thank you so much. My wife and my family is grateful for you, for for the team come in, in my church. Thank you. Really, thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome. It's so nice to have you with us again this morning. And a very special thank you to Pastor Roberto and his team in El Salvador. Uh, you'll notice, as was mentioned a few times through the service, it'll be an opportunity, a reminder, if you'd like to give toward that need in El Salvador. Uh, we're just so grateful we have the opportunity to bless them and just to pour back a little bit into them as they have poured so much into our children and our young people who were with them just a short while ago. So we continue to keep them in our prayers and also to show them this tangible expression of our love and appreciation. Well, our scripture this morning is found in the book of Joshua, chapter 5. Joshua, chapter 5, verse 10 to 15. Small portion of scripture, at which point Moses has passed away, and Israel is now standing there on the borders of the promised land, uh, poised to enter into the promise God has for them under Joshua's leadership. And we read from verse 10, that while the Israelites were camped at Gilgal on the plains of Jericho, they celebrated the Passover on the evening of the 14th day of the first month. The very next day, they began to eat unleavened bread and roasted grain harvested from the land. No manna appeared on the day they ate, 
first ate from the crops of the land, and it was never again seen. So from that time on, the Israelites ate from the crops of Canaan. When Joshua was near the town of Jericho, he looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a sword in hand. Joshua went up to him and demanded, Are you friend or foe? Neither one, he replied. I am the commander of the Lord's army. At this, Joshua fell with his face to the ground in reverence. I am at your command, Joshua said. What do you want your servant to do? The commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did as he was told. You know, I think one of the greatest challenges of being a follower of Jesus Christ is to actually follow him. I'm reminded of the story when Peter was in the boat during that storm and Jesus invited him to walk out of that boat into the water. Jesus was not just inviting Peter into a miracle. I believe he was actually inviting Peter to walk where he himself walks. You know, what so many people tend to do is at some given point in their life, they'll receive Christ as their Savior, but then they go on living in a way that is almost as if they are bringing Jesus down to their own level of faith. But what we see from God's word is that if we're going to walk with God, it means to walk with him and to live with him where he walks and where he lives. In fact, there's a lesson that we can take from Israel's 40 years of wandering through the wilderness before they entered that promised land is that there are essentially two levels of faith. There are those who are content to just wander as long as all their needs are met from day to day, the basic needs, they're content to do that. But there are also those among the people of God who are not content just to do that, but they are people who contend. They are people who want to walk where God walks. They want to live where God lives. They want to leave the mundane, the ordinary, and they want to move into what it is and where it is that God is working. They want to lay hold of what it is that God has for them. The Bible says in Matthew chapter 5 that God causes his son to rise on the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And you know, for many people, Christians included, that's good enough. Again, as long as uh, one day flows into another, as long as my needs are met, as long as life is going okay, then that is good enough. And yet, if we're truly going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, one of the things we have to come to terms with is the fact that the Lord, his plan is not just to lead us through life in some kind of willy-nilly way. In fact, he says, I have a plan for you. And so if you're listening this morning and you would say, well, you know, my faith seems to resemble more the wandering experience of the Israelites. So I I really hope that we'll understand through the course of this message that as soon as you decide to move with God in what he is doing, then you're going to begin to come into a new place of understanding, a new place of experience and of God's purpose. Now we read in verse 13 that when Joshua was near Jericho, He looked up and saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up and asked him, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Now, I know in our Western culture, this tends to go against our our feeling of self-importance, but basically what he was saying to Joshua is this, Joshua, I am neither on your side nor am I against you. I am on the Lord's side. And what that means is if the Lord wants me to fight for you, then I'm going to fight for you. But if the Lord wants me to fight against you, then I'm going to fight against you. You see, Joshua, the only question that really matters is, are you on the Lord's side? Are you moving with him? Or are you moving on your own? And I want us to remember that question this morning. I want you to consider for a moment, are you moving with God? in what he is doing, where he is going, or are you moving on your own? Because the angel of the Lord said to Joshua, essentially, answer that question, and then you will know whether or not I am for you or I am against you. You know, one way that we get ourselves into trouble as followers of Christ and even those who don't know the Lord is that we get so caught up in our own pursuits We get so caught up in our own uh, goals for that week, our own desires, whatever it may be, that we expect God to feel the same way about those things that we do. And if the Bible says that whatever dreams you may have, whatever plans you may have, 
they actually pale in comparison to what it is that the Lord dreams for you. In Matthew 16, we remember the scripture very well, when Jesus said, if I'm calling you, he says, if anyone wants to follow in my footsteps, he must give up the right, all right to himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You see, one of the things that we often confuse is the fact that although Jesus promised that he is always with us, he does not follow us around. Let me say that again. Although Jesus is always with us, he does not follow us around. In other words, what the Lord says is that I am the Lord. I'm going this way. I want you to follow me, but you need to understand I'm not going to follow you around. Now, I really love Joshua's heart. It shows, I believe, why God chose him to be the leader of his own people. Because when the man identified himself as commander of the Lord, it says in verse 14 that at this, Joshua fell with his face to the ground in reverence. I am at your command, Joshua said. What do you want your servant to do? Now, I think it's obvious that this is not just a typical angel, nor is it even an archangel. This is actually Jesus himself. We know that because he receives Joshua's worship. But what I love from the scriptures, we see that Jesus appears to his people because he wants to personally lead them into what it is that God has promised them. Now, keep in mind that Joshua is a mighty man of war, an experienced man of war, a man of valor, a great leader under Moses, a great leader in his own right. And yet, when he comes up to this commander of the Lord's army, a man who is mightier than himself, then he is ready to relinquish his command and allow this commander to lead him into God's promise. And as I read that, it made me wonder sometimes if we really realize that there is one mightier than us who wants to lead us into what God has for us. We may feel stirrings in our hearts, prompting. We may feel a longing for something more. And it's the promise of the Lord. And with that promise, the Lord says, I stand here ready to lead you, but you must be willing to allow me to lead you. That is, you must be willing to let go of what you think you know, what you think you might prefer, or the way that you've done things in the past, and you must be ready to follow me at my command. Notice Joshua's response. When the angel of the Lord, the the Lord himself, the Lord Jesus, is standing there, Joshua doesn't get all excited and say, oh, it's so good to know that you're with us, that that God is with us, we're guaranteed to win this battle. Listen, we have to get going, I'll, I'll catch you up along the way. He doesn't do that. And yet, isn't that how often we behave? You know, the Lord speaks to us, and basically we say, Lord, you know, life is really too busy to concern myself with with getting to know you. Life is too busy for me to really concern myself with what it is you may have in mind. I'll do that someday. I'll get serious someday. But for now, I just need to know that you're there with me. I just need to know that you'll always be there if I need you. Essentially what we're doing is we're asking the Lord to follow us. But Joshua doesn't do that. What we see in the scripture is that in a posture of true humility, he bows before the Lord and he surrenders his plan. And he surrenders even his command. And he asks the only question that matters. And that is, Lord, what do you want me to do? You see, when you and I come to that place in our walk with God, and it may take decades to actually arrive at that place where, where it finally registers in our heart that the Lord is not going to be following us around, then at that point, I find people usually make one or two choices. We either walk away or we worship. And there are people who walk away from Jesus every day. They may not even necessarily leave the faith, but they walk away from what it is the Lord is speaking to them, the way the Lord wants them to behave, the decisions the Lord wants them to make, the priorities the Lord wants them to establish, the principles he wants them to live by, the pursuits that he wants to be priority in their lives. There are many believers who walk away from that because it's not what they want. It's not what they want to happen. It's not what they think is going to give them the most joy or fulfillment in their life, or maybe perhaps they're just intoxicated by the spirit of our culture. But then there are also those who know what it is to worship. And when we worship, we begin to realize that we don't really need all the answers to our questions. 
What we need is a revelation of Jesus Christ. We need a fresh revelation of who he really is. The revelation that he wants to show us because it's in that revelation that we find the answer to all the questions that we have. It's in that revelation that many of the questions begin to dissipate and we realize that they're not that important after all. So we have that choice when the Lord is speaking to us. We have that choice when we stand on the edge of something new the Lord wants to bring us into. We can either say, I don't want to relinquish control. I, I, I just don't want to do it that way. That's not what I have in mind. And we can walk away. Or we can recognize who's speaking to us. We can bow our heart and we can worship him. And we can say, Lord, whatever it is you want me to do, Lord, I will do that. And then begin to look forward to experiencing things in the Lord that we never would have experienced in our own self. Psalm 16 says, Commit to the Lord what you do, and your plans will succeed. Commit to the Lord what you do, and your plans will succeed. Now, of course, we know that that doesn't mean that we are to try to get God's approval after the fact. But what it means is that we bring our plans to God in prayer before we commit ourselves or before we commit our decisions or our resources to whatever idea that may be. And you know, I find that's where so much confusion enters into people's lives. Because so many people tend to live by the axiom of simply just trying to do or choosing to do what it is that seems right at that moment. What might seem best for us at that moment. We might most enjoy doing at that moment. But the problem is, is that when it doesn't work out, when we experience frustration, when we experience failure, then we begin to reason to ourselves with the devil's help that God didn't come through. And if God didn't come through, then I guess basically what he's saying is, I'm on my own. If God didn't come through the way I thought he should have come through, then I might as well just go on living the best kind of Christian life that I can. After all, it appears that I'm on my own anyway. But you see, we're not on our own. The Lord hasn't left us. The problem is we have done what we thought seems to be the most logical thing to do rather than committing our plans and our control to the Lord first before we commit ourselves or our resources to whatever that idea may be. The Bible says in Romans 8, we know it well. We know that in all things, God works for good with those who love him. We know that God works for good in all things with those who love him. Now, you need to write this down somewhere. Write this down. If you love Jesus, then you will love his will for you. Let me say that again. If you truly love Jesus, then you will love his will for you. You will take time to quiet your heart to discover what his will may be. And his will is not just this enormous plan for your entire life. His will is just whatever decision or issue it may be that is before you at the moment. He will reveal his will to you for that. And if you love the Lord, then you will love discovering what his will is for you in that particular issue. And you'll love, you'll delight in doing what it is the Lord has shown you. As he reveals it to you, your heart will come alive in realizing this is true. This is what I need to do because it's packaged in the Lord's power and in the Lord's love. You will want to do his will, the scripture says. And you see, his will is not some big, mysterious blueprint that you have to try to figure out. This is very important to understand. God's will for your life and mine, it unfolds to us over time as we commit to the Lord what we do. Let me say that again. His will unfolds step by step, day by day, decision by decision, as we commit to the Lord what it is that we want to do. That's what's called walking in the Spirit. You submit your plans to Him before you commit yourself to any one of those plans, any one of those decisions, any one of those purchases, any one of those commitments, whatever it may be, you take it to the Lord. I just so happened to read an Instagram post from Pastor Jack Hayford this week that tied in so beautifully, and this is what he said. 
when we are considering any change or decision in our lives, we must make certain that our sensible, practical plans have first been laid at God's feet. And he puts those words sensible and practical in quotations because oftentimes we think if it seems sensible, if it makes sense, if it seems practical, well, how can we go wrong? We might as well just go ahead and do it. And what Pastor Hayford is saying is no matter how simple, no matter how sensible those plans may be, it doesn't mean it may take days to decide. It could be just a few moments. But whatever it is, first lay it at the Lord's feet and have his input. The Bible says that Joshua didn't walk away. Joshua worshipped. And we know that worship is so much more than just singing songs. Worship is surrendering our life. Worship is surrendering our plans, submitting them, bringing them to one who is greater than us, and simply asking him, Lord, what would you have your servant do in this situation? We're going to read in verse 15 that the commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did as he was told. Now, taking off shoes speaks to two essential things. Number one, it speaks to our desperate need to stop and to spend time with God. You know, when you have someone that you love that comes by your home, what do you do? When they enter the front door, you take their coat, you hang it up, you say, hey, kick off your shoes, go sit down, kick your feet up, stay a while, let's visit. That's that idea of taking off our shoes. And taking off our shoes in God, is God's way of saying, listen, stop asking me to follow you around. Get off the treadmill. Stop. Quiet your heart. Sit with me. And then begin to walk with me and work with me and watch what I'm doing. Watch what I want to show you. A second aspect of removing our shoes is understanding that if we want what we call a touch of God on our life, then we have to remove that dirt. By touch of God, I mean very simply that quiet confidence that accompanies you through the day. And we all know what I'm talking about. That, that sense of peace, that sense of when you've spent some time in the Lord's presence and you, you feel refreshed by the Spirit's presence, you feel washed by the Word of God, you feel that your, your thoughts have come into alignment, you have this, this sense of confidence as you move through the day, this sense of presence as you move through the day, and you're confident that the Lord is going to be able to do through you what pleases Him. That is the touch of God on your life. And hear me, friends, if that does not excite you as a follower of Jesus Christ, nothing will. There's nothing more fulfilling there's nothing more satisfying or exciting than walking through the day knowing you have the touch of God upon your life and that he's able to work through you as he pleases. When the Lord told Joshua to remove his sandals because it was a holy ground, he was basically saying, Joshua, if you want me to walk with you, then you need to leave that stuff behind. You need to come clean. The psalmist said in Psalm 66, if I had not confessed my sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. But God did listen. He paid attention to my prayer. Praise God, who did not ignore my prayer or withdraw his unfailing love from me. You see, this morning the devil wants you to believe that you cannot come to the Lord if you've sinned. You can't come to the Lord if you've blown it. You can't come to the Lord if there's some area of your life that's controlled by sin, whatever part that may be. But I want us to understand this morning that is a lie. Joshua came to the Lord. Joshua came to holy ground. And he came with his sandals on his feet. He came with the dirt on his feet. But the key is that Joshua was willing to remove that dirt once he got into God's presence. And once he did that, he began to receive his instructions from the Lord. You see, if you have sin that you're not willing to give up, if you have plans 
If you're determined to live a certain way, if you're stuck in certain things that you know the Lord wants to set you free from, if you're determined saying, no, I'm not going to relinquish control of this. I'm going to continue to do what it is that I want to do, or I'm going to continue even just live a, a normal life and make regular decisions like everybody else. I'm not going to take time to listen to the Lord, to quiet my heart, to commit my plans to the Lord. If that's your attitude, and yet you still want the touch of God in your life, it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. You see, there are things in all of our lives, and, and I think all of us know what those particular things may be in each individual case. We all have things that we would love to have the Lord deliver us from and move forward. But that's never going to happen. That's never going to happen if we're not willing to give up that sin. If we're not willing to choose the Lord's way instead of our own. It's just that simple. Now, I said at the outset that most of us surrender our lives to Jesus at some point in time in our life, and then there's a habit for many to simply go on through life from that point on, just reducing the Lord to their own level of faith. And then over time, the devil convinces us that since God hasn't come through, as maybe we expect him to, then we might as well just live life on our own. And we still believe in the Lord, we still consider ourselves Christians, but we just settle for a lifestyle where we just do the best that we can do. Because after all, we, we feel like we're on our own anyway. It's kind of a, you know, a crapshoot. We just don't know if God's going to show up or not. It's just tossing one up and hoping for the best. And the devil convinces us that this, this life of faith is actually futile. But you see, the real issue is simply this. Jesus is always with you, but he will not follow you around. He says, I have a plan for you. It's this way. I have a plan for you. You know what it is. You know what I've shown you. You know what I've spoken to your heart. And I'd really love you to join me. But if not, I'm not going to follow you around and just bless what you want to do yourself. You know, all of us have Jerichos in our life. All of us have those things that just seem to be impenetrable. And they stand between us and what it is that our heart really longs for. But I want to promise you this morning that if you're feeling that way or, or if you feel like, you know, Pastor, I've just been wandering for so long. I want to encourage you to understand that however long you may feel like you've been wandering, God's promise for you has never been withdrawn. The promise, just like that promised land, it is still there. It is just waiting for you to take it. But there's a couple things you have to do. Number one, as we shared, you have to decide whose side you're on. You have to decide if you really are a follower of Jesus Christ. Because if you are, are you truly following him? Are you truly positioning yourself to hear what he's saying to you? Are you committing your ways, your plans, your decisions to him? Or simply are you just hoping that he's following you around for whatever it is your plans may be? You need to decide whose side you're on. And in those times that you may feel disappointed, in those times that you may not understand, you may not even agree sometimes with what you know the Lord is saying to you, I want to encourage you, number two, don't walk away. Don't walk away and settle for some kind of pseudo-faith, as Paul talks about that, that has a form of God in this but never experiences his power. Don't walk away from the Lord, but instead decide to worship. And again, if you will worship, you will receive a fresh revelation of who Jesus is and his love for you. You may not have, have all the answers to all your questions, but you'll have a revelation that actually speaks to all those questions. And again, many of those questions will dissipate as you have a fresh revelation of his love for you, of his power, of his might, that he is greater for you. He's made you a promise, and just like Jesus did to the children of Israel, he will show up personally to lead you in. He will walk with you if you will walk with him where he walks and live where he lives. And finally, of course, be willing to remove the dirt. The Lord wants us to stop playing with sin. The Lord wants to show us those things that are blocking our communion with Him. The Lord wants to show us those things that are robbing us of that simple yet powerful touch of His presence upon our lives that comes 
when we come before the Lord and we are committed to allowing him to cleanse our hearts, to cleanse our spirits, and submit ourselves to him so that we can begin to move into the promise that he has for us. If you feel like you've been standing on the verge of something for a long time, or maybe in this season you felt somewhere like you've been in a rut, you just haven't been moving forward, I want to encourage you to consider these three things that I shared this morning. Because the Lord personally is standing with you and inviting you to walk into what he has for you in whatever area it may be, but he's asking you to submit to him and to follow him in obedience, and he will bring you into that promise. Let me pray with you before we close this morning. Lord, I thank you. I thank you that you not only give us wonderful, exceedingly great and precious promises, but Lord, you personally stand with us to lead us into every one of them, that we might share in the miracle with you, that we might share in the joy, Lord, of, of newfound freedom, of newfound wisdom and understanding of life experience, of ministry, the gifts you've given to us, whatever it may be. I pray for each one listening here today, Lord, whatever you've been stirring in our heart, may there be just a fresh passion to go deeper in you. Lord, to even take advantage of this time that we may have of relative quiet in our evenings especially perhaps. Lord, just to spend more time with you at your feet, to hear your voice, and Lord, to walk in new things with you. We thank you, Lord, for your great faithfulness, that you are our personal Lord and Savior. And we commit ourselves to you afresh today. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 May the Lord bless you. Have a wonderful week. And as we close out our service this morning, the children have a song they want to sing that I trust will bless your heart. May the Lord bless you.